Hello, everyone, and welcome to the official launch event for the Institute for Security and Technology. My name is Philip Reiner. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Institute. It's really great to have all of you here with us on this virtual call here today. There's a large number of folks who are dialing in. We're really excited to have you with us. A lot of you have been to some of our events in the past, people that we've worked with over time, but some of you may not be familiar with some of the work that we do, so we're really excited to have you with us here today for this announcement. Um, by way of background, uh, for those I have not had the chance yet perhaps to meet in person, which I look forward to doing uh, when we get back to being able to do that, um, I'm somebody who started my career uh, around security and technology issues when I was at Raytheon Company working in their space and airborne systems division, um, working on electronic warfare, working on uh, putting the rover on Mars, a, a wide variety of, of technological uh, innovations that led me to move to Washington, D.C., where I got a graduate degree from Johns Hopkins SICE, uh, and then went into the Pentagon, where I worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Policy for about a decade, the last four years of which I was detailed over to the White House, uh, working on the NSC staff. And my last role there was as the Senior Director for South Asia for President Obama. So that's my background. That's how I've kind of found myself working on security and technology issues. We have a fantastic agenda for you all here today. It's a veritable tour de force, 90 minutes of deep dives into international security issues, advanced technologies, and a little bit more on the impetus behind why we're launching the Institute for Security and Technology here today. Our launch really comes at what we feel is a critical time. I don't think there's anybody on this call who would argue that our society and that our national security establishment is keeping up with the pace of changes that are being wrought by technological disruption. There are so many opportunities that are being created by technology today, but there are also so many inadvertent consequences that we collectively need to get together and work on to collaborate on to find the solutions to. I think looking back to to last week and the technology uh, committee hearing uh, focused on technological comp competition. I think that's just one example of kind of this, this real growing chasm between the people who build these technologies, the product managers who are working in these companies uh, and those who are in the national security space and those who are working in the federal government, not just here in the United States, but around the world. That's just one example. Um, there's a, a wide array of examples of the things that really could use greater attention from an organization like this. Technical solutions that already exist for things like routing security. Why aren't those more broadly disseminated? Why aren't they better understood? We're working on issues like this. How is it that militaries can integrate cutting edge artificial intelligence capabilities into their systems while taking into account the vulnerabilities this may create and the ethics that need to be built in with those systems? These are issues that we grapple with. How is it that digital technologies are going to impact democratic institutions? How do we get ahead of that? That's a project we've been working on with our partners in Washington at, at CNAS. And as we're also painfully aware, there's a pandemic that's really ripping around the world and through this country. And yet there's technical solutions that are on the shelf that really need to be in the hands of the people who need them most. So as the international geopolitical landscape uh, is being meet, really remade here at the beginning of the 21st century. What's needed is a trusted, cutting edge facilitator who can convene quickly, who can convene the right people and convene on the most relevant topics and come up with solutions to be able to do the research and do the analysis, talk to the right people and experts, get them together and come up with solutions that are action oriented. This is what we're all about at the Institute, which is actually doing something about the problems that we're grappling with. It's not your typical think tank. It's not your typical nonprofit. We're trying to fuse a bunch of these lines of effort all into one entity. So take a look at our new website, securityandtechnology.org. One word, securityandtechnology.org. Check it out. Give us your feedback. It's a brand new site. Went up yesterday. Before swinging into things here today, I absolutely have to say thank you to those funders, those supporters, those backers that have been with us for, since the beginning. You're what have made this possible. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, the foundations, the companies, the individuals, we're only here because you believed in us and we're really grateful for you having put that, that faith in us. So 
We're here today uh, to kick things off. We're actually going to be joined by two of our biggest supporters, two of our board members, our board chair and a member of our board of directors, Mike McNerney and Dan Birkenstock. Mike and Dan, welcome. Hey, thank you, Phil. Uh, and thank you everybody for being here. Um, this is a big day uh, for our organization. Um, when uh, I co-founded along with others on this call, uh, then called Technology for Global Security, now called the Institute for Security and Technology, um, it actually started off very informally uh, as just a group of people that would meet uh, often for pizza. Sometimes we called it nuclear pizza and uh, just talk about security issues. Um, and over time, we began to realize that there was this gap that we felt wasn't really being uh, addressed. And that is that there are an increasing number of really difficult global and national security issues that have a strong technology nexus. Um, and so we actually decided to go ahead and formalize our organization uh, and launch the, the startup think tank uh, that we are presenting to you uh, here today. Um, and we wanted to do that based on basically three principles. Uh, the first was uh, that it should be founded and based and centered uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, and that's because uh, you can't really understand these technology issues unless you live in a technology ecosystem um, and truly get to know them. Uh, number two, that we should have in our organization staff with people who understand policy and also have a deep familiarity with the technology itself. Again, a common theme. Um, and in some cases, we have people who've actually built technology and brought technological solutions to market. Again, bringing that deep understanding of both technology and policy. And then finally, we sought to partner uh, within the broader national security ecosystem um, in order to add a value add to these really important conversations that are already going on. And I think that's what we've done over the last couple of years um, under Phil's leadership. And I want to thank Phil especially for his tireless efforts over the last couple of years to get us to this point um, and to this launch uh, that we're uh, doing today. So Phil is going to bring you through the rest of the program, uh, which I'm very much looking forward to. He's going to talk about what we do, how we do it. We have a great lineup of speakers that I'm really excited to hear from and to learn from as well. Um, and with that one, I turn things back over to Phil. Yeah, and what I'd like to do actually is, is and Dan, you're, you're a member of the board of directors, you're somebody who's been a part of this for a while now, kind of get a, a sense from you as to why you're a part of this and why you feel that this is an important initiative to, to be standing up and to be a part of, to be supporting. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be here today at what is, um, on, on one hand, uh, a giant step forward for this organization going into the future with, I think, a really strong and clear mission. And on the other hand, is a culmination of, as Mike said, a lot of really hard work that's gone in um, to, to codifying and exploring a number of different ideas and approaches by Phil and the team over the last several years. So great job to everyone who has worked on this. You know, as I've listened uh, to, to conversations amongst the board members and other people that we've we've brought in to discuss this, you know, the thing that's really jumped out of me over and over again is this observation we've all had that um, society, in many ways, is is much more fragile than we would like to believe on a day to day basis. We've seen that in ways big and small. I think on the big side, uh, within our generation now, there have been really two major. Uh, events that have, have shaken us from 9-11, which shook our confidence in air travel and transportation, to now COVID, which has decimated our confidence and an ability to, to live in the, the public square. And beyond those, there are, you know, a, a, a wide range of issues that we all confront on a day-to-day -day basis from credit card fraud, to digital security, to uh, the ability to safely uh, and securely cast a ballot in, in our elections. And what we kept coming back to as we thought about these issues was the fact that they're all too big for either the technology companies who are driving the digital revolution or the government who has to consider the policy implications and the legal framework within which these technologies should operate to tackle on their own. This is something that, that requires you know, both, both literal sides of the country uh, talking and coming to common cause on, on how we should best protect society in the future 
while taking the best advantage possible of these new and enabling technologies. And so what we kept coming back to was this enormous opportunity for there to be a trusted intermediary, an explainer, uh, a convener, a matchmaker in some cases, you know, a, a group of folks that could be seen by, you know, by both the technology community and the government and security community as, uh, as a neutral third party um, who could who could jump into this gap and help ensure that um, the issues are seen before they arise, and that um, and that you know the right people come to the table to talk about the best ways to mitigate the you know the potential ramifications of new technologies as they develop. And you know the the question that ultimately we asked ourselves is what what opportunities are there for a new organization to um, to avert you know the potential life-changing impacts for our kids and for our grandkids down the road. Um, you know, I'm, we're so struck by things like uh, the, the emergence of antibiotic resistant bacteria today. You know, there's a lot of talk that in 20 or 30 years, the surgeries and procedures that we take for granted today could become much more dangerous. You know, is there a parallel where the, the internet, the digital communications, the digital payments, um, the life that we live online, you know, could suffer the same fate, you know, and I think that, you know, as we look at what we can walk into in the future, it's very exciting to consider, you know, the, the types of things that this institute can now address in a, in a more uh, streamlined and focused mission, and I'm really happy to be a part of it and to hear what everyone has to say today. So thank you for joining us, and I look forward along with the rest of you to, to hearing the rest of the lineup. Yeah, thank thank you, Mike and Dan. And again, thank thank you to everybody who's who's on the call with us here today. Quick word on logistics, and then we're going to jump right into this. Um, we're going to have a series of conversations that we're going to work through today. There is a question and answer option for all of you who are watching from home to submit your questions, and we will get those to the speakers. And I'm just going to dive right in with our with our first speaker here today, Dr. Sarah Sewell, who we're super excited to have with us. Uh, Dr. Sewell, the former Under Secretary of State. Uh, now SVP for policy at NQTEL. We could not be more pleased to have you with us here to, to speak about some of these really hard issues today. Well, it's great to be here, Phil. I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be part of this. I think that there's so much, uh, uh, there's so much work to be done and there are so few organizations that are well positioned to jump into the middle of it. And so anything that I can do to help, including help you relaunch yourself is, is a privilege. Thank you. So the the way I was hoping to kind of dig into this from the outset is to talk a little bit about your journey, um, to, to look at the career path that you've had, is, which is just an absolute inspiration, um, to work on the really hard issues that you have, democracy, human rights, uh, thinking about these things through a security lens and trying to galvanize new solutions to what really are some of the hardest problems in, in the world. Um, as now the, an SVP for policy at InQtel, um, thinking about technology and thinking about how technology plays a role in those issues. Can you speak a little bit for, for those who are listening as to how that evolved for you over time and, and how technology from your perspective plays such an important role when it comes to democracy and, and things like human rights and human security today? Sure. Well, I was a child of the Cold War. And so I started off in nuclear issues and arms control and conventional weapons and then as the Cold War ended, was really interested in how to bring values and norms into the security conversation. And so that took the form of humanitarian intervention and questions about the use of force. That's what I did in the Pentagon and, and starting a peacekeeping office there, but also in a, in a decade long conversation with the US military that I did from my perch on the faculty at Harvard about how to mitigate civilian harm in war. And technology was a theme in that, but, it was um, it was a subset, and I think as as you pointed out, it was really when I when I became responsible through the the role that I played at the State Department for being an emissary for the United States on behalf of democracy and human rights around the world that I began to realize that the promise that we had all expected would come from the empowerment of the internet was in fact being really perverted by a number of governments around the world, and so. Um, you know, I worked a lot on issues of, uh, of Tibetan human rights, and that brought me into the issues facing the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And so 
the use of technology by, by China, often in the name of providing public security or fighting terrorism or doing other things to essentially um, suppress and in some cases incarcerate and to certainly surveil and separate a whole class of persons within the country, huge wake up call. And it wasn't just China, of course, in which the government was using technology uh, as a means of suppressing human rights. And, and technology was also becoming really critical in sort of the levee on mass incitement of violence, whether it was recruitment of terrorists or whether it was sending, you know, false videos of, of injustices that then struck mob violence. And so, mm -hmm. so the, the, the exposure that I had to technology as being a real perversion of what we stood for as a country was something that really stuck with me at state. And anybody who serves in a senior government capacity in the foreign uh, affairs world is yeah. also really struck by the intersection between economics and technology and our foreign policy. And so when I left state and I came to, you know, to focus on the United States again, first of all, it seemed to me that there were, as Dan was saying, there are some there are some analog problems that we have to address here in the United States in terms of threats that technology poses to our democratic system. And those are, are truly troubling questions that we have yet to grapple with and we really need interlocutors and help there. Mm. But the other thing that I've realized increasingly is, is, that, is that technology is so much bigger even than we think of in terms of the daily tools that we use for our lives. And we're really poised for some dramatic revolutions. It's not just sort of the machine learning to AI transition. It's what's going to happen with synthetic biology. It's what's going to happen with the first country that makes a breakthrough in quantum. And, and one of the things that's become really clear as we look at the 5G conversation in the US is that the export of commercial technology entails both hard security risks and real risks to values, real risks to democratic systems. So all of that sort of fused together to bring me to InQtel, where, where the organization itself is really looking at geopolitical trends and looking at what we call truth tech and how do we, how do we provide incentives for the private sector to help meet what we think of as public good requirements. And it's just been a fascinating journey in which I continue to learn. And there are so many avenues to explore within that broad topic that your organization will never lack for an agenda. Yeah, it's there's there's almost there's almost too much for us to uh, to try to tackle. We have to we have to be prioritizing things. I think one of the one of the things that I that I pick up on there and how you were explaining it was as you were in those roles in government, you you saw how technology perhaps played played a role, and you have a sense now at NQTEL as to how much more could be added, how much more value could be added there. How do we how do we make sure that those bridges are being built between these different communities, and how do we make sure that um, these are really being incorporated into uh, those considerations within perhaps the, the, the State Department, for example? Well, you know, anybody who's worked in government is familiar with the phrase whole of government. And the reason that phrase has persisted for over a decade is that the U.S. government is not very good at, as, at operating as a whole of government. And there are a couple different dimensions there that I think we could perhaps unpack. I mean, one is we have come much to our detriment, I believe, as a nation to equate our security with our defense spending and with our defense capabilities. And so um, we, in effect, become blind to some very important vulnerabilities that have to do with how we've developed our own uses of technology, how we've defined the relationship of our government to our citizens vis-a-vis -vis technology, how we think about the use of technology by foreign powers, how we invest as a government in technology. I mean, when you think about the relationship that the government and the private sector had during the Cold War, it was quite a different relationship. And it was one in which the government sort of proudly played a galvanizing role and would yep. you know, articulate the moonshot and invite the collaboration and saw the fruits of that as benefiting both the economy and the security establishment and helping us solve social problems. We've moved very far from that to the point where really, I think, to our detriment, we've relied too much on the private sector to innovate, knowing that the private sector is motivated by a different sort of value proposition than the public sector is. That's why they're different sectors. 
So, so the, the challenge of trying to get government to both think in a holistic way about security, which is something that ironically the pandemic might be helping teach us, yeah. and the importance of trying to bridge the different specializations and the complexity of how to solve these problems from everywhere, because state can't solve a problem without commerce, without treasury, without the, 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 the science foundation and doing the research and development, and without all the other plethora of national security actors, the, the challenge of bridging these, the challenge of redefining these, and the challenge of framing the questions so that people can find benefit from a collective solution is really, I think, um, hmm. the art of the challenge. So we have to understand what these security threats are. We have to understand where the opportunities are. We have to understand what the different motivations of the players are and find some win-win propositions to move the country forward. Something that's very hard to do intrinsically from any single stovepipe. And it's precisely the kind of work that the Institute could facilitate, I think, really helpfully. Yeah, and it's, it's a big part of the conversations that we've had. I mean, going back to the time that I spent in the Pentagon, um, one of the things that we always struggled with was exactly what you're talking about, which is that that whole of government strategy and trying to actually just fill one piece of it instead of actually trying to do all of it from the Pentagon's perspective. Um, I think one of the the elements of this that that come to mind it's a conversation that we have fairly routinely at two star three star level, but also down at the operational level, is is how you know, how do you integrate that that better understanding of the econ piece, a better understanding of the diplomatic piece. How do you empower that piece of it? It's a real it's a real challenge, but it is part of what we're trying to do is to build the bridges between the people who have that conversation. We're getting questions from the audience for you, and I'm, I'm curious as to your response to, to, and I think you you have some serious thoughts about this, in terms of how a lot of these technologies that we're, we're grappling with today are really inherently dual use, and how we're, and we're pulling them into in these environments, and something that we see with uh, the pandemic and COVID, there's solutions that are technically oriented that potentially could make it more feasible for us to get back to work and to open things up. But there's a there's some complications there. Um, these are complications that you alluded to in your opening comments about what's happening in, in other countries that are a bit more on the authoritarian side. Can you speak to that a little bit as to how we should be thinking about the dual use nature of some of these technologies and ensuring that they don't have horribly inadvertent consequences? It's really, I mean, to, to take that one question, which is a great question and and sort of bring it up a level, I think it's really, the issue in terms of what does a democratic society believe it can do both procedurally and substantively in shaping the development of tech. And we have not grappled with that adequately. Um, you know, even thinking about how we review weapons, sort of the, 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 the normative piece is often a subset. We don't even have a process for thinking about tech vis-a-vis -vis society as a whole. There are issues of trust, there are issues of technical understanding, there are issues of honest assessment of downstream complications. All of these questions lack sort of, they lack a forum, they lack a, a, they lack a, a, a way to be translated to the general public. I spend a lot of my time at InQtel trying to translate very complex technical and economic concepts into things that are accessible to policymakers. That is a huge job. It's not dissimilar to what I faced when I when I tried to bring sort of military issues into non-military audiences. That translational function is huge. But we need to have a process whereby we have that conversation. And I think process is the thing that will be perhaps um, least controversial because then you have to have the criteria or the principles by which you'll be making decisions. Those are gonna look very different in a democratic society than they are in an authoritarian country. And the process of getting there is going to be much messier. And the solutions will be probably ever changing and always adjudicated and negotiated. And I don't know exactly where we're gonna end up. If you think about even the question of encryption in the context of the US as being a huge elephant in the room in terms of security and individual rights, we don't have an answer on that as a society now yet. But we know that if the international community's answer is driven by, for example, the standards on privacy that China wants to be and is in the process of putting through international bodies or is embodied in 
technology that becomes the infrastructure for the rest of the world that is accessible to the Chinese because they've got the 5G infrastructure and, oh, they're layering mobile payments on top of it. And, oh, here, look at now what can be known and, and the kind of leverage that comes with that. We may have a very difficult time coming up with our own principles, but I think we can all agree, and I firmly believe, that whatever we do as a democratic society is going to be more right than the answers that come from authoritarian alternatives. And we need to, to take that process seriously because the international standards, the international norms, that groundwork is being laid through the economic process right now. And we, in some ways, are really behind it, which is a very odd place for the United States to be. We've led norms and values development in the international yeah. arena for forever. Yeah. And now the, the technology is really driving that and the commercial export of technology is driving that. We're no longer the main force there. This, so it's not just an internal conversation. It's an external geopolitical conversation as well. Yep. yep. This is so much of what drives the core of, of why we're building the Institute here which is that you know at one point policy is what really drove technological development in a lot of ways whereas it's quite the opposite today where technology in so many ways policy is trying to catch up and we've got an immense amount of work to do there um sarah i know that was really fast and almost like a flash in the pan but we are super excited for all those who are listening uh sarah is actually going to be uh coming on and joining our strategic advisory board at the institute so this is not the end of the conversation you all will be uh, hearing much more from Sarah and seeing the, the incredible work that she's that she's doing. Th thank you, Sarah, so much for joining thank us you, here Phil. today. Yeah, um, really excited to all those who are at home listening in for our next segment. Um, I'm very pleased and very happy to introduce um, a member of my team. First of all, Vera Zakum, who is a policy and technology advisor for the organization, um, who has spent time working on information operations, who's spent time working on Russian disinformation, was at Twitter for a little while. But even more so to introduce uh, the the founder of Craigslist himself, uh, Mr. Craig Newmark. Uh, Craig, th thank you for being with us here today, and and uh, for uh, really wanted to say thank you for Craig Newmark Philanthropies, and and the work that you have been doing. Uh, really, I don't think it's an overstatement to say that everywhere we look, we see Craig uh, putting uh, money where where the the hard problems are whether it's supporting journalists, whether it's um, trying to give more people uh, a, a role in these decision-making processes. Um, and what we're here today to announce is for, for everybody is a fellowship that we're launching, this Future Digital Security Leaders Fellowship. Um, and this is really uh, entirely possible because of Craig's generosity. And it's something that folks, if you're interested, go to the website, it's live, we're, we're taking applications. But we wanted to say thanks to, to Craig here today for making this possible. Um, Craig, it's really, it's a huge benefit to us, but it's gonna be even that much more beneficial to those that we're able to bring in. The intent behind this, right, is to try and give more young people a shot and to give more people a chance. who are coming in from just straight out of school, but wanted to say thank you, but also to give you a chance to talk a little bit about what you're doing with Craig Newmark Philanthropies and just all the various things that you're involved in in trying to ensure the elections and trying to defeat disinformation, et cetera. Thank you for being here today. Hey, it's my pleasure. The idea that our country and our election is under attack by foreign adversaries and their domestic allies seeking to take advantage of the way in which foreign intelligence services are destabilizing our country. I figure I'm not all that smart, but I've now located a network of networks of people who are really good at fighting back, at taking the battle to the enemy. You guys are doing that, particularly when it comes to election interference and cybersecurity. Uh, there are other people doing really good work across a full spectrum of information warfare. That even includes, and we recently announced support for the Girl Scouts of America cybersecurity effort, specifically where the Girl Scouts Council of New York are training underserved girls in cybersecurity. I think that's fantastic. And 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 Vera, did you wanna did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I mean, 
Thank you again so much, Greg. I think, again, to echo Phil without your generosity, none of this would be possible. I'm curious if you can comment on the importance of uh, enhancing diversity in this broader field. I mean, beyond cybersecurity and information warfare, you fund um, efforts, women in technology. You also work on veteran issues and other correlated initiatives. And particularly as we seek to stand up this fellowship and give uh, folks, young folks, an opportunity and a leg up to really invest at this intersection between emerging technology and global security issues. I, we think of you as really a partner and an ally. So I would love to just get a comment from you in terms of the importance of doing that and uh, really in, ensuring that we have a diversity um, in this ecosystem. Well, for me at least, diversity first comes from the notion that you wanna be fair to people. Specifically, you wanna treat people like you want to be treated. Beyond that, given the attacks in our country, this is an all hands on deck kind of thing, much like uh, World War II, where everyone was expected to pitch in and to defeat uh, the people who were attacking uh, our country. Uh, specifically, I'm finding by supporting vets, by supporting uh, women uh, in the workforce, and even by supporting people of all sorts of different diverse environments, we're getting a much richer potential task force or who can help fight the enemy. This is in cybersecurity, but it's also in areas including in influence operations. Influence operations are where people seek to destabilize our country by questioning the legitimacy of the election or even actively sabotaging it. For example, we're seeing uh, attacks against the post office, which is vital for our democracy to survive. Um, we're seeing all sorts of influencing operations even come from major American uh, newspapers. And the way we fight back there is to remind all of journalism that it's untrustworthy to amplify disinformation. And when you fight against the amplification of disinformation, you take the battle to the enemy. I couldn't agree with you more. Having myself spent my career thus far in this field, you know, I think 100%, it, number one, it, all, it takes all hands on deck. It does take voices from all different backgrounds um, and views to really, uh, really win this fight, if you will. So Phil? I, the, the thing I wanted to come back to, Craig, was you were you were mentioning uh, what what the work that you're doing for the, the Girl Scouts in, in particular was something that you had, had referenced. Was there a little bit more that you wanted to to make mention of there in terms of how that's actually going to work for people, just so they they know how to uh, take advantage of what's happening on on that side of things? Well, the announcement for the Girl Scouts is online. Uh, somebody could look it up. It has to do with getting more systems and training to underserved girls throughout New York City. That's a really good place to start. It actually originated when they asked me to buy cookies for some purpose. And the uh, to get to the bottom line, I bought a thousand bucks worth of Girl Scout cookies, an assortment with a lot of Thin Mints for the NYPD 6 Precinct, nice. which is the one in, that serves Greenwich yep. Village. But a lot of these things are happening in a number of areas. Right now, uh, one way in which the country is attacked is by harassing women journalists who seek to write the truth. To that effect, I'm supporting a whole bunch of organizations fighting harassment online with a great focus on countering harassment directed against women journalists for that look up the International Women's Media for, uh, Foundation. That's IWMF.org. That's fantastic. And Craig, if I could, uh, before we transition into the next segment of our event here today, um, just from a personal perspective, as, as the founder of Craigslist, as someone who's so you know well known for that piece of, of things, what really inspires you uh, and, and inspires Craig Newmark Philanthropies to, to be so active and involved in uh, in this really critical field of, of work, of trying to support journalism and trying to support those voices 
and giving people more of a, of a fair shot. Well, in terms of uh, fairness, in Sunday school, Mr. and Mrs. Levin, uh, again, taught me to treat people like I want to be treated, to give people a break. And when it comes to American democracy and history, Mr. Shulsky in high school history and civics reminded us of the importance of the Bill of Rights as amended. And he reminded us that a trustworthy press is the immune system of democracy. Well, uh, ordinary citizens need to help strengthen that immune system. It's all hands on deck. If you know how to help, you got to stand up. Thank you, Craig. And it's it's really uh, an immense uh, contribution to what we're trying to do with the Institute. We are Definitely standing up. We're bringing people into the fold. We want to do more of exactly what you're talking about. Um, I can't thank you enough for for helping us with the fellowship. And everybody, please definitely take time to to look at what Craig and Craig Newmark Philanthropies is doing. It's really amazing, just the breadth of everything that he's involved in. Thank you again, Craig, for joining us here today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Craig. So everyone uh, who's on the call here, we're going to transition into our next segment. We're super excited. Uh, Vera, I'm going to be handing over the reins to her, and we're going to welcome the one and only uh, Dmitry Alperovich, uh, who is now running something a little bit different than what he uh, was uh, first involved with, with CrowdStrike. Uh, welcome, Dmitry, and, and we look forward to hearing from you a little bit about cybersecurity, disinformation, election security, and the Silverado Accelerator. Vera, uh, Dmitry, over to you. Okay. Well, thanks, Philip. Dimitri, thanks so much for coming and joining us. I mean, it's such an honor. And I can say also from pers personally, having been uh, in this field uh, for some time and hope, you know, look forward, obviously, to being in this field for a while. It really is an honor for everything that you have done, not just for the field of cybersecurity and technology, but also really for the country and for the democracy. So again, yeah, welcome thank and you. thank you. Um, so I guess my first question to you is, you know, you have been a leader in cybersecurity and technology for most of your career. And if you think about what do you feel is the gap really between the technology and technologists that make the technology, especially across cybersecurity firms, platforms and so on, and actual the policymaking. And how do we actually go about bridging that gap? And I'm also curious to that, if you can tell us a little bit more about the Silverado Policy Accelerator and, and how you hope to do that with your new initiative. Thanks for having me, Vera. Really appreciate it. Um, so I, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Silverado because uh, we're still in, in the formation stages, haven't formally launched, I'll, I'll give you a preview. But, but I'll, I'll give you sort of my view on this. And, and it's really interesting because from the beginning of our industry, people have realized that there are sort of three critical factors to solving, if you will, or mitigating the risk of cybersecurity. It's technology, it's right. also policy and people. And uh, too often in our industry, we focus on the first one and completely ignoring the others. And um, this is something that I've been very passionate about from the beginning. I, I'll tell you, when I was still in college and pursuing uh, my studies and about to enter the field of cybersecurity, I also had a secondary passion, which was foreign policy, and took lots of courses um, on international affairs in college. And when I left uh, college and joined the industry, really thought that that would be sort of set aside, never to be used again. And then 2010 happens, uh, a little known hack uh, of Google um, that, that I called Operation Aurora. Uh, and I saw the joining of the international affairs and cybersecurity. And ever since then, it's become really um, inseparable, uh, which I think is the right way to think about this. Um, I've uh, uh, said um, for many years now that we actually don't have a cybersecurity problem. We have a China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea problem. Uh, of which cybersecurity is, is a significant component. And what I mean by that is, is not that those are the, the only four major actors on the, um, in the cyber, cyber realm, at least as, as it relates to us um, here in the United States. Uh, but when you really look at the entire landscape of the most consequential attacks that are taking place, uh, a great deal of them are from these four nation states, uh, but also um, a huge number of them are from cyber criminal groups that are residing in part in those nation states and are protected by those nation states uh, from extraditions and prosecutions and in some cases even supported 
and hired by those nation states. So when we're trying to deal with this problem, we inevitably run uh, headfirst into the overall relationship that we have with each one of those uh, four countries. And to address cybersecurity, we really need to think about how do we address the geopolitical, issue, geopolitical issues that uh, underlie all of it. So um, this is something that I've been passionate about for a while. And now as I'm sort of transitioning uh, out of um, uh, direct involvement with industry, although I'm still an angel investor and uh, on a number of boards of great cybersecurity companies, uh, but I really believe the next phase of my life is about policy and uh, having sort of addressed technology in the first part of my life. I want to focus on the second. Yeah, I mean, I 100 percent agree with you. I mean, I think there's such a huge nexus between the two. And I think that there is just this really greater need for both the national security policymaking community really truly understand the, both the opportunities and the challenges right, of technology and the vice versa. Absolutely. So with that. You need to give me the 411 here. I think is probably the question on everyone's minds these days. You were instrumental in finding the Russia's attack on the DNC server in 2016. Fast forward four years later, we're 2020, we're less than 100 days from the US presidential election. So are we still, well, even with, with that actually, uh, we, now we have what? Polarization is rampant, deep partisanship. Oh, and then we also have this thing called COVID-19 pandemic going on as a stage setter, right? So are we still dealing with Russia? Is it Russia or is it potentially other actors that you're worried about? Like, what keeps you up at night when it comes to our upcoming election? And I'm also curious about, are you worried about a potential leak or even a potential October surprise here? It's a good question. Um, I will give you actually a very contrarian answer in that I'm not too worried about a repeat of 2016. I think that that play has run its course and, and was uniquely uh, applicable to the candidates that were running in that election that I don't think is easily repeatable. And in fact, you have seen this, the Russia try to play the same playbook since 2016 in the French election, uh, just last year in the UK election to really no effect whatsoever. So um, I think in many ways, we've amplified their role in 2016 uh, and given them more credibility and more power as a result than they actually deserve. Um, I think their influence campaign uh, was actually pretty minimal. You look at you know, all those Twitter posts and Facebook posts, very few people actually saw it and not clear how many of them were actually persuaded or uh, people already believed in it and then just uh, you know, amplify their own beliefs. Um, and, um, you know, the hack and dump, I think, was impactful, but in many ways, because the Hillary Clinton's campaign made it impactful and they, they didn't address it head on and kind of got tied it up in knots um, uh, responding to it. Um, so I, I don't think that the same play can be as effective, even if it were run again uh, this, this time around. But I, what I actually worry more about is the uh, integrity of the election infrastructure itself something that um, was not really targeted destructively in 2016. There's no evidence that um, the Russians were inside the election systems or manipulated it. Uh, however, um, not just Russians, but even criminal actors can absolutely target with ransomware attacks some of the infrastructure we still have in this country um, that unfortunately does not have a paper um, audit trail. And imagine you know, if this election is once again close and you have counties and battleground states like Pennsylvania, Florida, and some others that still don't have paper trail, and you have a ransomware attack that actually destroys votes, right? And the uh, impact that it can have on our constitutional system. So that's something that I worry more about than social media and um, hack and dump um, that I think um, we've overplayed the significance of. Do you think, I know there's a recent effort to put more funding, congressional funding into uh, the states themselves to protect election infrastructure. Do you think that is what's needed immediately or are there other initiatives, other things that we need to focus on? I think the most important thing we can do is have paper trails in every single um, county in this country. It is a crime that we still don't have it. Today, despite the fact that not just 2016 happened, but for many, many years, election security experts have warned us against uh, 
electronic voting machines that don't leave a paper trail. It's, it's too easy to manipulate them. It's too easy to have even mistakes that can happen. Um, the, the companies that make the, this equipment do, do not have the best security. And you know, at least one of them was hacked in 2016. Um, so that's the most important thing that we can do and should do. And uh, yes, Congress should absolutely allocate money. It actually, um, there aren't that many counties left, uh, thankfully, but um, we should absolutely be allocating money to those counties to replace the infrastructure. Unfortunately, it's too late for this election cycle, but certainly for future elections, we should not have another election without every precinct and county in, in this country uh, not having paper paper trail that can be audited uh, and checked and, and given assurance to the citizens that uh, their votes were cast and, and counted legitimately. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we can all agree that the integrity of the vote uh, is going to be a very a major issue uh, this upcoming election, regardless of where you sit, uh, where you sit on this issue. Um, I want to take you back to the early days, if you will. Um, if you think about, if you could give advice, you know, to your younger self, and you're just starting your career in both tech and foreign policy, national security and cyber, and now sort of flash back to that time, what advice would you give? And I ask that because there's so many inspiring and aspiring up and coming um, students and emerging leaders uh, that want to be in this space, again, at the intersection of national security, foreign policy, and cyber, as well as information and disinformation space. So I think from a leader like you, it would be wonderful to hear kind of what advice you would give sort of to the next generation or even to your younger self. You know, one of the courses I took in college that at the time uh, I was not necessarily thrilled about taking, it was a mandatory course, um, and then, to be honest, we paid a lot of attention to it and nowadays regret was the ethics course. Um, and at the time, I was like, you know, I'm going to cybersecurity. Of course, it's ethical. Why do I need to worry about ethics? And uh, I'll tell you throughout my career, uh, there were so many numerous situations where you thought about um, what is your moral core? What are your core ethics on these issues? And what hard decisions do you have to make with regards to your career, with the decisions you, you make in business? Um, with regards to it. And that's something that I think a lot of people that are going into this field with a very technical background mm -hmm. don't pay enough attention to. You look at all the issues we now have with artificial intelligence and the biases you can int introduce with the training data, uh, with privacy, and um, you know the, the decisions that the, the tech community has made in terms of aggregating all this data without thinking necessarily about the implications of it that can have disastrous impacts on human life and human rights and, yeah. and so forth. Um, that's something that I think is now such an important part of not just cybersecurity, but technology in general, that uh, I encourage everyone uh, while in college to really read up on these hard issues. And, and unfortunately for many of them, there are no easy answers. There are always trade-offs, but um, now it has become fundamental to technology as technology grows in importance. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I want to leave a few minutes just for a few questions that we're getting from the audience. Um, so uh, the first question is, with respect to election security, does the U.S. have a national security, national strategy problem, or are we really are talking more at the state and county level? Well, we do have a fundamental issue that elections are squarely in the jurisdiction of the states. And there's actually very little that the federal government can do except allocate money uh, and provide advice and guidance. Uh, but this is um, clearly a responsibility of states. In many cases, actually, counties and precincts that in some cases are their own constitutional officers, where even the secretary of state in that particular um, uh, state can't, can't tell them what to do. Right. Um, so it is a frustrating problem in that uh, you can't just wave a magic wand if you're president or if you're a congressperson and solve it. Uh, but there are certainly incremental steps that we can do, we can take um, to make it better. And I would say, the, the again, not to harp too much on it, but the paper ballot issue, it doesn't solve everything, but it solves a lot of the problems um, that we have and is such an easy solution. Oh, absolutely. And then I'll just ask one more question from the audience. What are your thoughts on the recent legislation, proposed legislation, to designate a national cyber director at the White House? And 
So look, I, I, I uh, th- this is one of the recommendations that came out of the Solarium Commission, yeah. which um, uh, you know I had an opportunity to advise, and uh, I, I think it's a good recommendation, but um, it's not going to be panacea. The reality is that uh, you have a lot of entrenched interests and a lot of entrenched agencies with a lot of power, NSA, DHS, um, DOD, and others. Um, that even if you have someone in the White House with some some limited authority, they're not going to be t- able to tell, you know, four-star general what to do. Um, and um, while it can be helpful in coordinating policy, let's not kid ourselves that once we get this person, all of our problems are solved. We've got a wrong load, ro- long road ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Dimitri, um, I want to thank you. Um, this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, and I am uh, pleased to introduce uh, the next segment here. Uh, so the next segment is going to be uh, focused on a very, very important topic. Um, the, the topic is really on really elevating uh, the voices in uh, diversity and inclusion and allyship. Um, I would like to welcome um, Alexa uh, Wesner. And who is the operation research manager uh, for uh, Institute for Security and Technology, along with Camille Stewart, who is the head of security policy for Google Play and Android, as well as a uh, very important co-founder of Diversity and National Security Network. Uh, in addition to uh, Camille, I would like to welcome Lauren Buita, who is the CEO and co-founder of Girl Security. And I think this conversation is particularly important because these women are actually working on very, very important issues to uh, strengthen diversity, uh, strengthen inclusion, and strengthen allyship. Thank you for that introduction, Vera. And might I add that on Thursday of this week, Camille will be hosting a hashtag share the mic DEF CON happy hour, where practitioners and allies will share their thoughts and experiences in breaking down systemic racism across cybersecurity. So definitely keep an eye out for that event. And also on this upcoming Friday, Girl Security will be hosting an event with Dr. Fiona Hill on election security, disinformation, and overall empowering women in national security. So register on the Girl Security website for that. Um, So Lauren and Camille, you both have led powerful and inspirational careers and are currently doing foundational work to increase diversity across national and cybersecurity. Lauren, your organization, Girl Security, focuses on increasing the representation of women in national security and building a pipeline of young women to feed into national security careers. And Camille, to add to the many hats you already wear, you were the 2019 Cybersecurity Woman of the Year in the Barrier Breaker category. In June, you co-started the hashtag Share the Mic and Cyber campaign, and you have recently authored multiple articles on breaking down systemic racism in cybersecurity. So I would really like to ask both of you on a more personal note, if you could speak to some of the challenges you have encountered through your initiatives and what are ways that these challenges could have been mitigated? I can help. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I can start. Um, so the thing that I find is a lot of people have the heart for these issues, but not a lot of people have the stomach for them. Um, and there is a real difference. So while people tend to be empathetic and understanding and want to see change, the desire, the impetus to stand in the gap for folks and to leverage their status, um, potentially lose ground, those kinds of things that actually are required for change to happen is, is a little bit elusive. It's a harder proposition to make. So we are in this unprecedented time where we're locked in our homes, COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we live and work and has really forced us to focus on some of the tough truths about our society. And in this moment, I think people are stepping into that that stronger stomach um, to advance some of these important initiatives around systemic racism, racism and discrimination of other kinds. And so the biggest challenges are people putting their time, talent, and resources behind specific efforts, people feeling empowered to do so, and people understanding where there are opportunities for them to plug in. Every advancement starts at an individual level, whether that's you volunteering for an organization like Lauren's 
or are you in a meeting advocating for your peer who has gotten left behind or is getting left out of a discussion or something bigger, um, you know, like being empowered to change how your organization looks at hiring or recruiting or how your organization looks at the controls and the policies and the other things that you are implementing to see how race or sex or gender or any of these other things are affecting how these things will be adopted and their efficacy in general. Um, everyone needs to understand that they have a role to play and step up in, in doing that work. So having conversations with your peers, having tough conversations, uncomfortable conversations with those around you, find people who are willing to engage in that dialogue after you've done the work to understand what's going on is a really important part. And then filling the gaps, whether it's a program like Share the Mic in Cyber, where you leverage your social media platform or, um, or something bigger. Um, so I can share, first of all, Camille, I'm so fortunate to share the mic with you today. Um, you're just a remarkable role model. Um, I was actually having a call with one of our 17 year old, or actually she's 18 now, junior board members, and she founded her own kind of cybersecurity program. She's remarkable. Um, and she called me yesterday and she said, I've been thinking a lot about national security, which of course I was like, yay. And then she said, but all of a sudden I felt myself pulling back because I felt like I was becoming really partisan in my thinking. And I don't wanna be partisan or political in my thinking. I kind of just wanna do good. Um, so I think one of the primary challenges we've had with girl security, at least when I founded it in 2016, was these kind of pre-existing notions of what national security means and how politicized it has become. Um, and what's kind of interesting with respect to STEM is that STEM education initiatives were founded in the early 2000s to better enable the U.S. to compete in the global economy, of course, economic security being a national security imperative. Um, and what we have found in our work is that STEM education often leaves out a discourse around national security. And so a lot of what we talk about internally as an organization is if we don't introduce national security into this discourse, as a nation, are we foregoing an opportunity to build a future workforce around this really important purpose? And specifically for girls who are, we call it an unsought aptitude, but exercise a security aptitude every single day where they're adapting to different threats. If we don't talk about security as part of the STEM tech and security workforce, we're not only depriving girls of an opportunity to engage in a field where they have um, a very experienced aptitude, but we're also then kind of perpetuating a field that is defined by traditionally by men. Um, and so we're cutting off not only a future workforce, but we're also limiting the type of innovation that we think girls bring to national security. Thank you so much. Um, going off of that, what do you both feel that industry and government where applicable can do to promote diversity and lower some of these barriers across security fields before the job pool? So in other words, how do we grow the interest or the openness early um, so that it's a much broader, wider pool from the start? I think Lauren's points about access and exposure are extremely important. Um, I don't know that you can divorce early exposure from cultivating the talent that exists in the, in, in the industry, right? People need role models. People need to see that they can actually climb the ladder, break the glass ceiling. They need to see people thriving in the space. If all they ever hear are stories of defeat or of pulling out and, you know, experiencing negative um, environmental and so social uh, interactions in that industry, they're not gonna continue to, to, to progress in that industry, regardless of the programs that we put in place. So you can't divorce them in my mind, but that access and exposure piece is really important. There are so many young women who have no idea that national security is a place that they can play and have no idea, even if they are interested in technology issues, that that is a national security imperative and the linkage is there. Um, and so access and exposure via school, via role models, via um, implementing programs in schools that actually make this a part of the curriculum. Programs like Girl Security are so important. Um, you know, there are opportunities for us to open the aperture for the next generation. And if we are not making intentional strides towards doing that, 
across the pipeline, across the spectrum of, um, of uh, like career level, we are doing ourselves a disservice. I would agree with that. And I think, you know, we kind of, kind of half joke that um, the missing S in STEM is security. And I think rather than trying to um, ask young people to conform to uh, this kind of set of initiatives around STEM, which, and I don't mean that to sound as a pejorative, it's not, but I think it's creating a personalized experience for young people so that we empower them to see their value in this space as opposed to trying to conform their value to the space that we want. And I think the previous speaker mentioned, I just heard him mention ethics and, um, you know, we're talking about a future society shaped by technology, which is going to require all kinds of skill sets. And for us, you know, we believe that girls kind of have this unique set of experiences that allow them to adapt to what's certainly going to be a rapidly changing security environment. And that discourse about security can be scary, but it doesn't need to be. And so I think the sooner we can start talking to young people about national security, empowering them to define it for their generations, the more buy-in we'll have for them to kind of contribute to this overarching purpose that is quite critical across the board with the many security challenges we face. Yeah, just to add to that, and quite frankly, the boldness of the next generation is what yeah. we need in security. <laughs> no. and yeah. We need it so much. And harnessing that early um, will allow them to step into that and own it in a way that's different than kind of jumping in later. And so it's really important. Yeah. So we are getting some questions in from the audience right now, which is great. Uh, people are wondering, going off the boldness point, how can we alter the bias in the conversations around national security right now to enable that boldness? I mean, I think part of it is creating space. And I guess I'm just speaking through the lens of girl security, but it's creating space for us, for girls, girls of color, different populations to amplify their voices. They're talking about national security. They are literally, you know, there was this article that referred to the digital domain as a battle space. They are on the front lines of that battle space. They want to engage. They have opinions. You know, TikTok set off this remarkable discourse around national security um, on our Instagram. Um, so it's really creating the space for their voices, but it's also validating the voices of girls and young women, and I think just young people generally, and giving them an opportunity for their voices to be amplified and take what they're saying. Because what we always say is young people, specifically the girls we work with, they know more about technology than we do. They'll be better prepared to shape the future than we are able to train them right now. We can provide them with skills um, like ethics and strategy and critical thinking and innovation, but ultimately they're changing as rapidly as the technology is. And so I think the more we can do to empower young people from diverse backgrounds, especially, um, I think the more, not only the more secure we'll be, but I think we'll be more prosperous as a nation. And that can start right now in the programs that you are building, in the dialogues that you are having. Um, your organization likely has a cross-generational setup. Mm -hmm where you've got younger practitioners and, you know, more experienced practitioners and their perspectives are going to be different, even if they are studying the same issues. The way that, you know, younger generations are critical of the decisions we've made globally, the, the solutions that we are implementing, the policies that we are building, the way they're thinking about how the technology weaves into that is completely different. And we do the dialogue, we do the event, we do the research a disservice by not including their perspectives. So if we start that now with the folks that we already have in the industry, that will continue to permeate as we pull girls into the conversation, as we pull young women into the conversation. Because to Lauren's point, we need that diverse set of experiences, lived experiences, age, um, and how they are coming to these issues from a you know, first generation, I adopted technology from the moment I came out of the womb perspective to folks who are adopting it later. We need all of those perspectives in each dialogue. So I know you both have discussed things that can be done right now, volunteering, creating space, like in your everyday life. Some of our viewers are wondering how they can contribute financially to the initiatives that you both are involved with. Um, girlsecurity.org. <laughs> That's 
our website. Um, uh, I, I actually always kind of joke that it's a really bad donor pitch because you talk about, it's like when you plant asparagus, it takes seven years to harvest. Um, you know, we're betting on the long term with our work. We see girls thriving and pursuing careers in national security. But ultimately, we're talking about, we're, we're putting it aside and saying, you're going to build a better future. And they already are. So for us, it's wonderful. And our website is girlsecurity.org. Um, that's one way to financially support the work is a donation. Yeah, and cybersecurity for Share the Mic and Cyber, uh, we're always looking for partners. We also have a scholarship for the Black practitioners that have participated. So if you go to um, share the mic in cyber.splashthat.com, you'll be able to find more information, both about the happy hour, but also about ways to donate and support. Um, for Diversity and National Security Network, head to our website, diversityandnationalsecuritynetwork.com, and we can talk about opportunities to collaborate and support. Well, thank you so much, Camille and Lauren, for taking the time to be with us today. Your careers and your initiatives and the work you're doing right now is so insightful and inspiring, and we really appreciate having the opportunity to speak with you on these issues. Thanks for having us and the opportunity to speak. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you, and congratulations. Yes. <laughs> So I now have the honor of introducing General Joseph Votel, who will be joined by Philip Reiner. General Votel currently serves as president and CEO of Business Executives for National Security, which is a national nonprofit composed of senior business and industry execs who volunteer their time and expertise to assist the U.S. national security community. With an illustrious 39-year military career, General Votel served as the former commander of United States Central Command, United States Special Operations Command, and United States Joint Special Operations Command. Today's conversation will focus on the emerging character of war, technology, and special operations forces, great power competition, and the need for greater trust and collaboration between industry and national security policymakers. Over to you, Philip. Thank you, Alexa. And General Votel, it's a real honor to have you with us here today. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. I'm uh, very, very glad to be with you. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, uh, absolutely. And it's it's altogether well-deserved. Um, I thought maybe we could kick the conversation off by, by going to a, a question that I know has been kicked around by folks who are contemplating how artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, all of these new AI-related capabilities are being infused into militaries around the world. And this question of how it perhaps is changing the character of warfare. You've seen everything over the course of your career. You've grappled with some of the hardest problems that a military will have to deal with. How have you uh, seen the, the character and perhaps the nature of war change over time? Is Has it changed or has it really kind of retained its, its core character and, and its core nature? Well, thanks. I think it's a, it's a great question. It's a great question for people to reflect on. And, and I think the way that I'd respond to this is I, I talk about maybe some things that haven't changed, some things that are changing, and then some things that are kind of coming back uh, as we kind of look at um, look at uh, nature of warfare. You know, what, what hasn't changed here is the brutality of, of war. Uh, ultimately, this is a human endeavor. This is people against people. Um, and it is a clash of wills, and uh, it is inherently brutal. And uh, I would caution anybody who thinks the technology can uh, help us find a bloodless uh, way out of this uh, to, to consider, consider something different, because that's certainly not what it is. I was describing for someone the other day what it was like as the commander of CENTCOM to visit West Mosul or to go to the city of Raqqa. Um, where the fighting was, uh, you know, absolutely uh, required bulldozers to to dig out ISIS. That's the nature of the of the of the fights that we're involved in, and so we shouldn't lose the fact that this is going to continue to be a human endeavor. It's going to continue to be brutal in whatever manner that we move forward. But there are some things that are changing, as you've alluded to. Technology is is uh, is changing the, the character of the battlefield. We're thinking about things like cyber. It's expanded out. Certainly, space uh, is expanding uh, the areas of conflict out. Um, you know the, dig the uh, digitization of our <clears throat> of our of our communities of our 
nations of our economy are providing new and vulnerable ways for people to come after us and wage warfare uh, on us in other ways. Um, social media uh, is uh, is changing and then in, 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 in making the, in, the environment increasingly uh, complex. The domination of information uh, out here is, uh, is, is changing the nature of war. You can know a lot. Uh, you know, it occurred to me a number of years ago when we were, I was involved in an operation just by watching the news, I was learning about, uh, about the operation as it was being reported on. Uh, and uh, I think that just is a, is a way of highlighting just how important the information environment has come and how it has changed things. And of course, there's a technical divide out here to some extent. Uh, we, we've embraced a lot of things, but even when we look to our very best partners, uh, we begin to see a technical divide here is uh, where advanced, uh, more advanced countries are moving much more quickly than others are. Uh, and this is creating some disparity in partnerships and alliances and other things that we have to pay attention to. And what's not changing, or what, what we're seeing, actually, those are things that are changing, but what's kind of coming back is the idea of competition. Uh, you know, for the last 20 years, we've been, we've been really focused on things like counterterrorism, rightfully so. Uh, but now we're much more focused on competition. And while we don't necessarily use the uh, phrase another Cold War, it's, it, it takes on some of those same uh, aspects here that we are actually competing economically, mm-hmm. ideologically, um, you know, diplomatically with, uh, with competitors around the world, whether it is China or Russia um, or some of the other regional actors that we, uh, that we take place. What, what uh, you know, what, what's also kind of coming back, I think, is the importance of other elements of national power. Uh, you know, we've seen a, a focus on the militarization of our policy over the last 20 years, and we've certainly seen the military be in the forefront of this. But what this new competition is going to require is going to require us to bring our statecraft, it's going to, you know, bring our ideology, it's going to uh, require us to bring our economic and business power to the to the table. So there's things that are staying the same, there's the things that are changing, and there's things that are kind of coming back uh, to the future of warfare from my perspective. So your, your career has really, uh, at its core, been oriented in the, in the special operations community. And one of the pieces of this that I was hoping to dive a little further into keeping in mind everything that you just laid out. And Dr. Dr. Sewell spoke at the outset of our event here along the lines of what you were just saying in terms of, you know, it's the entire, it, it's all the, the dime spectrum, right? It's not just the military element that's really required going forward, how that needs to be built back in. The, one of the things I wanted to be able to dive into with you, though, is, is how you mentioned cyber. So how is cyber uh, being integrated? How is it being understood? How well is it understood within the special operations community? And where could they maybe get a little better? Uh, where are the gaps? How has it changed the way that they train and equip, et cetera, just with a focus on the special operations community in particular? Yeah, thanks. Well, you know, I, I, th- I watched this in, in uh, very up, up close, front and up close here during our campaign against ISIS. Uh, one of the things that Secretary Carter did early on in, uh, in the campaign was really put a focus on cyber command uh, to really begin to develop capabilities that we could use against this sophisticated ISIS enemy that had uh, that had, well, that knew how to operate in the in the cyberspace and was using things like social media and a variety of other things in, in the cyber arena to, to pursue their goals. And and what you, what you saw is you saw a concerted effort uh, by Cyber Command to begin to develop uh, individual tools uh, that they could that they could use against this. Then you saw them actually taking those tools and and, and moving them into almost a, a cyber uh, campaign, if you will, a cyber operation where they were bringing a variety of things together over time against specific targets to have impact. And of course, the, the highest order is when we actually were able to do what I just described, but do it in conjunction with our maneuver and fires on the ground and, and in the air. And, and, uh, and I think we were, we're we think we've matured with that and we're, and we're certainly uh, much more effective at that. The, the special operations community, just by nature of their, of the type of people that it has, the, 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 the mission that it has, 
the focus on targeting that it uh, that it contains really I think uh, helped 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 us optimize that. Uh, and of course now that's all migrating out to the broader uh, to the broader forces. So I, I think we're moving in the right direction with this. Uh, we will need to continue to push the bounds here. This is uh, this is an, an infinite area, and so we will un be unable to rest on our laurels. We won't have things like uh, legacy systems in the uh, in the cyber arena. We'll have to continue evolving as the as cyberspace evolves and as our adversaries evolve. So you know, in uh, in a force like uh, like the special operations forces are going to kind of lead the way in that because they're they're at the cutting edge of it. They're seeing it. They're highly innovative, uh, and they they have the resources uh, and uh, and the people to to really uh, to really uh, address that. You know, in terms of where we need to, you know, continue to focus, I, I think, you know, as as we'll as we've as we've seen in many many uh, times in the past in our military history, is that we um, is we've got to continue to focus on integration of these capabilities. Uh, we've got to truly professionalize uh, professionalize this this aspect of, and I'm speaking as a military man here because I'm put it in military terms, but we really got to professionalize and and institutionalize that aspect of our of our operations. Um, and so that, you know, much like we do with our maneuver forces or our logistics forces, that's what's really made us so made us so capable and so excellent in uh, in these areas was our ability to institutionalize and develop a career path of people over the uh, over the time of their service that really results in a level of excellence. Uh, and expertise that is uh, unparalleled. And, and so we've got to continue to do that. I'm not suggesting we're not. I'm just saying we've, there's more time to be to be focused on that. And we've got to, we've got to press and we've got to, our nation, and it's not just the military, the nation has to press hard on things like 5G and AI and making sure that we are, uh, we are mastering this and that we get there first before others do so that we can drive, uh, drive the norms and drive the rules and other things that go with that. One of the one of the huge challenges in in doing everything that you were just describing in terms of professionalizing this and integrating it into the various services into the special operations community, there's you know there's a lot of advanced technologies that get that get brought to the argument that perhaps aren't needed. Um, some of these things should be integrated. Some of them are really superfluous and not real helpful. Culturally speaking, it's difficult to pull something like machine learning tools into uh, the the battle spaces that you're talking about. Um, how hard is that cultural piece of this from your perspective at this point? Um, and then there's a, a follow-on question. I'm actually kind of going to integrate some of the questions we're getting from the audience as I as I speak with you here. How hard is it as you know we look at 10-year uh, production cycles for actually taking an idea and getting it in the hands of the guys and gals who really need it? How do you break through that in order to to make sure that it actually is getting in the right hands and it's, a, you know, acculturating, if you will, quickly enough? Those are yeah. those are a couple of different questions there, but really yeah, hard for all of us. Yeah, Paul, that's an excellent question. I think the issue from you know the issue as I kind of think of it really kind of comes to how do you scale up in these things? How do you take a unique capability that works well for a for an ODA or for a ranger company or something that's conducting an operation? How do you scale it up so it can be it can be uh, applied much more much more broadly? And and uh, and I think that's where we continue to have uh, have some challenges with uh, with doing that you know the soft community uh you know doesn't have any particularly unique authorities and acquisition stuff they have we've they operate under the same federal acquisition rules that everybody else does but what really what really is different in this is the mindset uh and uh the integration of leaders and uh, the idea of that uh that what we're doing here really makes a difference for people that are that are focused on the ground so there is a bias for speed there is a bias for action uh, and there's a bias for trying things out. You know, one of the great uh, techniques I think that we've seen in soft acquisition is the idea of buy, try, and decide. You know, if you find something, get it out there, try it, um, and 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 then I try if you can get it into a into a combat situation where you can really assess it, uh, and then decide whether it's 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 good or it's not good, and then you can get rid of it, or you can uh, you can double down on it. 
And uh, that I think is a really important aspect of it. You know, there's a, there's a lot that's emerging right now, I think in the broader uh, military uh, organizations and the services here, you know, the, the special operations community has had soft works for a number of years, but now you're seeing Naval X and you're seeing AF, AF works and you're seeing Army Futures Command and things like that that are all designed to begin to get after this type of uh, challenge right here. Uh, you know, there is a challenge that comes along with the institutionalization of acquisition programs. And uh, I mean, it... Uh, and for, for a variety of good reasons, uh, the Congress is involved in this. They are providing oversight on this. There are, uh, you know, uh, uh, concerns and, and issues uh, uh, with, uh, with that as well. So it, it is a, it is a, 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 a significant uh, challenge for us. There does need to continue to be uh, overhaul and, uh, and review uh, in terms of the acquisition process so that we can actually move uh, more quickly and take on some of the aspects that have served the, the soft community so well for such a long period of time. And one of the interesting pieces of the of the of the fight that you were alluding to earlier in the fight against ISIS um, was the fact that there was a need to partner and a need to work with allies and and others in the in the battle space, people on the ground, uh, partners coming from from NATO and, and elsewhere. Can you talk a little bit as we think about this through the lens of, of emerging advanced technologies, how much more difficult is that or how much better is it to, to try and partner to work by, with, and through our allies, which is really kind of the, the bread and butter of what, of what SOF is all about? How has that changed and how has it enhanced? How has it made more complicated with these technologies being infused into the battle space? Well, uh, you know, certainly I'm, I'm a strong advocate of uh, partnerships and, and making sure that our list of partners and those that are aligned with our objectives is longer than the list of those aligned with uh, with our adversaries' uh, objectives. And I think that's to me is the is the basic measuring stick here in terms of you know bringing people on board and, and getting people lined up against common objectives and, and shared interests as we as we move forward. So you know, with that said, I mean it's it is all about partnership. That's that's the key to this. Uh, when it comes to technology, uh, we have done better with some 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 partners, and we have done with others. Uh, the Five Eyes community, for example, I think benefits from the long Five Eyes relationship that we have had uh, with those countries, uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States. Uh, and there's a lot of sharing that takes place. Our soft, you know, again, falling back on the soft example, the soft forces are, are, uh, are near are all near peer like uh, in terms of their capability in terms of their quality uh, and so there's been a lot of sharing back and forth and we've seen the benefit uh, of that uh, it, it is that has proven to be more difficult reaching out to other partners you know I think of a country like France who played a significantly important role in uh, in the ISIS campaign and plays a significant role in the northern Africa and a variety of other places a very very capable military but yet they don't fall within the in the realm of five eyes and so there it becomes more difficult to share with them and to actually uh, you know pursue common uh, technical um, approaches here and, and we're going to have to break that down I think a little bit and we're going to have to look at how we how we do that how we do that I know there's always a sec uh, concern for security and, and we always have to be uh, we always have to be focused on that but we've got to um, we've got to um, make sure that our good partners that we're relying on that are going to bring not only their forces, but they're going to bring others with them to our alliances really are as enabled as importantly. And Philip, I would just say this also extends over into our security cooperation programs, you know, foreign military sales, foreign military funding that uh, we provide for countries to purchase American equipment. Um, this, is, this is important as well. We've got to make sure when those programs are put in place that our partners understand the sustainability, the upgrades that have to come along with that. Uh, what we don't want to do is find ourselves in a situation where we're relying on uh, another per, another country's capabilities that are similar to ours, but yet they're they're not updated. They don't carry the same tools, the same software, all the same piece. So we can talk to them, we can communicate effectively. We've got to kind of grow together, and 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 this this is going to require more concerted effort as we move forward. As as someone who's been uh, at, at the forefront of 
really how how geopolitics is shifting. There's really tectonic movement afoot. You alluded to this in, in some of the first comments you made in terms of uh, a return, if you will, of competition. Um, if you could speak very briefly as to how you you saw it on the ground from the CENTCOM perspective, the SOCOM perspective, obviously, uh, in that JSOC role, how did you see that beginning to change? How do you see it today? And where do you see the United States as it kind of finds itself in that competition? Is it keeping up? Is it falling behind? I uh, just wanted to to get your thoughts on those much yeah. more broader. Uh, it, uh, thanks. That's a that's a great question. You know, and and I and I, I'll just talk about my most recent experience as a CENTCOM commander because that's where I did see it a lot. Um, you know, when we pull back from a country uh, and make a decision not to provide them for military sales or our equipment, uh, they are going to go to somebody else. Uh, they're going to go to the Chinese or they're going to go to the Russians or they're going to go to somebody else and they're going to they're going to get the equipment because they because they believe they need it. Um, and this is the first way that, uh, in, in my experience as a CENTCOM commander, I saw this playing out where we had very good, longstanding partners across the region who we were, for a variety of reasons, some of them obviously very, very good, uh, concerns about human rights and, uh, you know, political legitimacy and things like that. Uh, we, we were withholding um, the sales of equipment or our process was so slow that we didn't meet their needs. Uh, and we have too, we have in their eyes too many strings attached to the equipment that we provide to them. We can only use in these circumstances and et cetera, et cetera here. And in some cases, this proved uh, onerous to them. And uh, when we couldn't do that, they went elsewhere. So that's the first way that you see it. Um, the second way you see that is them coming in is competitors coming in and forming uh, partnerships and alliances that uh, that in some cases are are uh, contrary to perhaps some of our long term objectives. Think of a place like Syria, where Russia steps in. I mean, uh, the, the Assad regime is pretty much on the ropes here at one particular point in about 2015, early 2016, before the Russians step in with the Iranians and kind of prop that regime up and, and for the most part, allow them to prevail, at least in the areas where they have influence. Uh, and then by by doing that, become a political player in the solution uh, in Syria. Uh, so this is a this is another way that we are seeing it. And of course, you look at someone like the Chinese, the, the Chinese are really focused on uh, on their economic uh, objectives. And so you look to a place like Pakistan, you see the China-Pakistan economic corridor, which literally bisects uh, the country. We see major investments by China into the port of Wadir. We see the large buildup that they've conducted in Djibouti. Uh, we see the uh, consistent presence of, uh, of Chinese naval vessels vessels in the waters of the of the middle of the Middle East, an area where they they never were, at least certainly not uh, on a on a uh, on a sustained basis. Uh, this is this is the third way that we begin to see it is by presence. It's by uh, deeper economic business relationships uh, that uh, in, the, in the long term increase their influence and lessen ours. Um, so you know, it's my my view here on on a place like the Middle East is that you know as we as we conclude these wars that we're in and, and they do need to conclude we need to bring these to their logical conclusion here hopefully through political political solutions but our our main effort really needs to be in in security cooperation and being good partners to uh to uh to our, the countries in the region that we uh, that we rely upon, and that's not just military. It's got to we got to bring the uh, the diplomatic component to that. We got to bring economic component to that, the informational component to that. Uh, what I found in the Middle East is that the countries want to be aligned with the United States, and mm -hmm. that's to our advantage. And we should we should try to find ways of doing that. And I think we can without compromising our standards um, uh, or the things that we hold dear as Americans. Uh, but uh, the the Middle East will be an area where great power competition will play out. It isn't just going to happen in the in the Indo Pacific, and it's not just yeah. going to happen in Eastern Europe. It's going to play out in in uh, in places places like Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq and other places here. And we need to recognize that. Uh, and uh, to me, that's the importance of this particular area with respect to uh, global competition. And Sarah, I, I do want to uh, be, be respectful of your time. I know we've got to wrap here quickly. I wanted to ask you one more very pertinent question for a lot of the people who are on the call here today who are coming from 
out here in, in Silicon Valley and who are at these companies that we work with so closely. One of the things that one hears about all the time is this kind of divide between DC and Silicon Valley and this challenge of getting companies to want to, to work with DOD. You mentioned uh, how those perhaps in the Middle East want to partner with the United States. I was curious if you could, because more often than not, these the engineers who are out here who have a little bit of an aversion to it, they don't ever really get to talk to uh, someone of your stature and your experience. What would you have to say to them about working with with the government or with DOD in particular? Thanks. Well, you know, I, first off, I would say it's OK to question your government. Um, and, uh, you know, that's our inherent right as American citizens. Um, it's the job of the government to earn the people's trust. Uh, and so we should we should do that. And so uh, I don't want anybody that questions the things we're doing. I don't want to give the impression that that's uh, that's wrong. Um, they, as citizens, we should be informed and we should question. Uh, you should. I always when I talk to groups, I uh, particularly uh, civilian groups, local groups that I that I talk to, I always encourage them to ask the question when they're talking to people. What's what's the strategy? What are we doing here? Where are we? Where is the end state? That we're that we're focused on, and sometimes you'll get a good answer, and sometimes you'll get a not very good answer. But you got to keep asking that question because what that does it forces people like me and others in the who have served in the government or are serving the government to answer the hard question for our people. So I, I want to emphasize up front that it's okay to to ask these kind of questions and to be introspective about it. That said, I do think you should look at uh, look at national uh, security through the lens of of, glo- of of kind of this great power competition that we just uh, that we just talk about. This is not just the military. Um, this is about uh, this is about uh, diplomacy. It's about our economics. It's about our ideology around the world. Uh, I think when you look over the sweep of time, the U.S. record is actually pretty good. Um, when you look at how we've engaged, I mean, uh, how we prevailed in the in the Cold War, you look how our country uh, led in a problem like addressing HIV and AIDS in, in Africa and globally. Um, uh, you see the coalitions that we brought to bear to restore order um, in different uh, places and a variety of things. You know, we've, we managed, uh, despite the presence of nuclear, biological, chemical weapons, to be, basically lead the world and devise standards and protocols that kept those those uh, weapons uh, safe, uh, used for deterrent effect, but not used for actual effect. Uh, and uh, that that's because of the type of country and the leaders that we had, uh, and and our our understanding of that. Um, you know, we've led in things like the internet and global communications, uh, uh, and it's kind of set the standards for uh, for all of that. And then I think you need to think a little bit about the alternative uh, that that exists in this. You know, we touched a little bit on uh, 5G and artificial intelligence. This is an area where I, I believe the United States should prevail. The United States and its partners should prevail in this area. We should be the first ones there with that. Because by doing that, we have the best opportunity to set the norms, set the rules for the ethical, moral, legal employment of these systems and to ensure that they're not going to be used in a way that is going to further undermine civil rights uh, or uh, disenfranchise uh, populations uh, out there. So uh, that is the best I think the United States offers the best alternative in this. And I, you know, I've just exhibit A is the Chinese here, and we've already seen them use tools like AI against their own people, uh, and uh, and and that should be a that should be a bell ringer for us. That uh, that if we don't prevail in this area, if we don't win this competition, uh, that we we will we will have to deal with an alternative that may not uh, may not support our objectives or our values. Uh, in the long run. So it's really, really important, I think, that we we ask questions, we seek answers. If we don't we if we don't understand, we ask the questions again and we try to clarify it. But we also have to look at this through a bigger and broader picture, the idea of competition. Uh, and uh, it isn't just military, it's it's everything. And sir, I, I think that's the perfect note on which we can we can end uh, this conversation. Thank you so much for your service, uh, and thank you so much for joining us here today. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you going forward. Uh, thank you for your time, uh, General. 
Thanks, uh, thanks, Philip, and thanks to everybody for uh, for joining us today. I, I, just, I should have said up front, I'm very pleased to be part of your strategic advisory board here, and you, uh, appreciate being asked. And I look forward to contributing here in the future. So, thanks to all of you. We genuinely appreciate it. Thank you. For those who are still with us on the call, I know we've gone a couple minutes over, but thank you so much for being with us here today. We're really excited about what we're building, but we couldn't do it without you. All of everything that we're doing is based off of the feedback that we get from you and from partnering with you on all of the projects that we work on. To our funders, again, thank you so much. Uh, but one last thing I have to say, well, right before that, to Spark Street Digital, thank you for being so professional. If you need somebody who can do a live broadcast like this for you, Spark Street Digital, we'll do it for you. One last thing I have to say is thanking my team, uh, to, to Vera, to Alexa, to Alex, to Leah, to Michael, the whole team, to Dan and Mike. Uh, really, this is a team effort. We can't, I can't thank you guys enough. To everybody who's watching, thank you so much. Be in touch. Uh, check out the website. We'll be hearing from you. Look forward to it. Thank you.